I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, I'm joined by Tom Ray, Chris Tarr, and Chris Tobin. We're talking about your favorite radio, your pet radio peeves, audio snobbery, and will 60 hertz always be? <laughs> Twerk is up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 89, recorded June 29, 2011. Audio snobbery. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Tello Systems and the new VX Voice over IP Multi Studio Talk Show System. On the web at telos systems.com slash VX. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hi there, everyone. I'm Kirk Harnack. Awfully glad that you've joined us for this podcast about radio technology. And well, I'm joined by three other fabulous engineers, fabulous engineers. And let's, uh, let's run around them right now and introduce them. Uh, first of all, from the Hudson Valley of New York, it's Tom Ray. Hi, Tom. Greetings, Kirk. And how are you this evening? I'm uh, uh, VP of Engineering for Buckley Broadcasting and work out of WOR Radio in New York. Fresh off ham radio field day and was climbing around on a tower today replacing a transformer that exploded uh, in a tower lighting system. Wow, and I want to hear about that in just a few minutes. Let's uh, check in with the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York, and CBS Radio. It's uh, Chris Tobin. Hi, Chris. Hello, Kirk. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm the uh, broadcast technologist at CBS Radio's six-station cluster here in New York City, uh, 3 a.m.s, 3 FMs, and uh, it's a busy time this time of year. We've got July 4th broadcast coming up this weekend, and uh, we've got a few other things coming up in the fall with the 9-11 anniversary, so it's technologies all throughout the summer. Cool. And also joining us from McWanago, Wisconsin, it's the man who keeps Starbucks in business and hails corners. Yes, it's Chris Tarr. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hello there. I am the Geek Jedi, worthy adversary, master of all electronics. I'm a <laughs> director of engineering for Intercom's radio stations <laughs> in Milwaukee and Madison, Wisconsin, and an avid Starbucks iced coffee drinker. But By the way, we're, we're not laughing at you, uh, Geek Jedi. We're just laughing with you. Oh, I'm sure. I've heard that a lot. <laughs> Well, it's, it's good to see you, and also great to follow you on uh, Twitter. Um, you, you, what, what's your Twitter, Twitter handle, Chris? The Geek Jedi. Pretty simple. The Geek Jedi. And I I'm, I'm, hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I invite everyone to follow Chris Tarr on Twitter. He tweets, uh, what, you tweet about once or twice a day, maybe? Yeah, this, this past week was slow because I was a little busy, but actually several times a day, and I always like to put little pictures of what I'm doing, of transmitters and things like that, yeah. too. So there's some good geek stuff on there. A lot of pictures of you drinking coffee. Arthur. There is. Well, you know, I like to share. You know, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys, we've got several things to run through today, some, uh, uh, some great topics, and the chat room is going to participate in some of these. They already have. About two hours ago, I put out, I tweeted a, a, a couple of questions, and we've already got a few answers to, so, to some of those uh, questions. Um, so, uh, but a couple things of uh, business I want to remind everybody of before I forget. Uh, next week, uh, episode number 90 is another War Stories episode, and somebody's going to be sitting that episode out because our guest, the engineer from Ireland, Andy Linton, is going to be with us on that show. It's two in the morning for him when we record the show, but he's going to join us anyway, and he'll have some Irish War Stories for us, and he doesn't talk that way at all. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to get right to a couple of questions, and a one that I want to cover because it's kind of fun. The question is, what is your favorite radio and i mean the physical box what is your favorite radio um who wants to go first ge super radio that's what i have uh, tell us what i've heard of that what what is a ge super radio well let's see uh how many years ago did they do this must have been 10 15 years ago they came out with a radio i think they did it intentionally for people who dx uh, signals ams and fms and it was a super selective super sensitive am fm uh, radio is a large speaker, so it gave audio quality that you enjoy for the FMs and AM. It had uh, wideband capabilities, and it was just it was super selective. I mean, it was just the original GE Super Radio. Then it went through several iterations, and GE the GE Super Radio two, three, four, and then it went back to the original after the others just didn't go very well. 
it's, it's black, it's rectangular, it's about the size of a shoebox, a little smaller. Uh, six, six batteries, D-size. Uh, it's great. It's got great audio. Uh, selectivity is excellent for FMs, and, and, and sensitivity for AM is unbelievable. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I use it at the office. I take it everywhere with me. It's good. You know, I, I, when I Googled um, GE Super Radio, of course, you can, you can buy them in a few places, Amazon, for example, and several other places pop up. But one thing that pops up pretty high on the list is the C Crane CC Radio Plus versus the GE Super Radio. Has anybody ever tried the, the, the C Crane Radio Plus? Yeah, I've got one. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's equal to uh, uh, the Super Radio. It, it, it's, act, it's a very good radio. Um, matter of fact, I have difficulty hearing WR here at home because I'm in the null. Uh, and it's very noisy in this neighborhood electrically. But uh, I can usually hear the station on that without a problem here in the house, not even outside. So, Tom, I, I got news for you. There's people in your SBE chapter that say you were born in the null. Well, I, 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 that's why I live in the null. <laughs> Once in the null, always in the null. Is that right? You got it. Yeah, net, net, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm just not a major lobe kind of guy. <laughs> hey, Mr. Tar, what's your favorite radio? I've got two. Uh, I, I, the Super Radio, I, I adore. I've got one. I use it all the time. It's got, you know, one of the other great features is the wide narrow switch for uh, for am so uh you know it's it's when you you're not surrounded by noise the fidelity on it is phenomenal uh another one that i'm i actually like and it, it kind of gets a bad rap for good reason because some of them were, we had some issues uh the boston acoustics tabletop hd radio i don't even know if they make them anymore but uh, i have two of them and i just love them the sound quality on those radios are just phenomenal unfortunately they were kind of deaf no they what Oh, deaf, 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 yes. deaf. What? Oh, yeah, I heard that. I never got to try one. In fact, uh, an early guest on the show um, uh, complained about that. The guy who complains about HD radio all the time. Yeah, well, <laughs> it does. It does work. Uh, it, it works. Yeah, I, I. I don't know if I got lucky. I've got two of them that work really, really well. I, I live uh, from my. Uh, tower sites i live about 30 35 miles away and with the little wire antenna i get all the hd stuff without any problems at all in fact uh, i simulcast my am on one of my hd channels and i actually get the hd channel but i get the am so uh it's a it's a good radio so you know i have a little little new technology a little older technology uh both have their pluses and minuses tom i kind of jumped in and asked you about the c crane radio what do you have a favorite radio or did you already give it uh, actually, I do have a favorite radio, and uh, matter of fact, I can, if uh, the uh, twerk guys pick up on this, uh, uh, I can show it to you. It's my uh, 1930 Philco Cathedral radio, which sits up in the living in a place of honor in the living room. Um, it, uh, it it looks like it just came from the factory. It's just very cool looking, and uh, you know those older radios had had a very broad front end on them. I I, I mean they've got uh, they weren't all that sensitive. You did need to put a wire on it, but uh, um, if we had 20 kilohertz, if we'd still transmit 20 kilohertz audio on the AM band, it would sound just phenomenal. It's absolutely incredible. It's got that nice warm bottom end to it. And I like this, it. <laughs> this is the the cathedral radio. Yeah, it, it it's a it looks it, they call it a cathedral radio. It's got the arch, um, and and I and I've put a link up here if uh, we could we can pull it up on uh, on Twert possibly. Um, you know, it's got the, it's got the arch uh, cabinet. It's yeah. it's a table radio. It, it's about oh I'm gonna say that high. Uh, one two three I think six or seven tubes. Um, just, just a very, very classy looking radio. It, it, it it's uh, when I think of old, like old radio or or the uh, heyday of radio back in the 1930s, I think of a, of, of a Philco Cathedral because it just kind of it looks like the era. Uh, no, is it actually called the Cathedral Radio, or is that your name for it? No, no, no they they call it the style is a cathedral. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, All right. and, and, and you know, there's also another style they call it the tombstone because it's square. It looks like a tombstone. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Okay, so yeah, but it, but it's very cool. I just like this radio. <laughs> yeah, we could do a whole show on on favorite radios, and I'm sure there are tons of radios from the you know from the the 40s, the, probably the 30s, and and uh, and uh, then uh, the, then the the radios made of bakelite uh, from the what from the 50s and 60s. I had a what a five tube AM radio uh, at my bedside as as a boy. I'd listen to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater from uh, from uh, uh, what station was that? Um, KFH, yeah, KFH in Wichita. 
Yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. Hey, uh, and my favorite radio is um, my favorite radio is the Tivoli, the t- or Tivoli. How do you pronounce that? Like ravioli or <laughs> Tivoli? <laughs> uh, the Audio One. And there's a link to it on that I've put in in the uh, private chat. If if Colin wants to put that up, uh, this is a this is a, a you know small uh, rectangular table radio. It just sounds nice. You know, it's it's the uh, it's the modern equivalent of something like a cathedral radio. It's got this nice resonant resonant uh, bass to it that uh, makes voice sound very nice. And actually, classical music sounds nice too. Uh, I have one. It's actually in my server room. It's feeding uh, it's it's feeding my Telos uh, uh, Zephyr IP. So when uh, people want to test the Zephyr IP, they're connected to my local uh, public radio station uh, via the uh, the Tivoli Audio One. And if I had a place to put it right here on the desk, I would, but I've got a mess on the desk. And that brings up our second <laughs> our second subject, which is uh, what's your pet peeve about radio? Now that we've talked about the physical radios, um, what's your pet peeve about radio? And it could be you know the audio quality or something that they program or whatever. And uh, if, if you're a, if you're a regular a viewer or listener of this show, then you're probably a fan of, of this humor. Colin, if you want to take it away, we'll see somebody's pet peeve about radio. Live at the Quahog Air Show, we're all ready for the Weenie Sound-Alike Contest. I don't know, bud. I don't think they can say my catchphrase because they no funny. <laughs> oh, there it is. And if you think you can say that just like Weenie here, you could win $97.1 for the cool weekend ahead. We have a butt. We, we, we have a butt. Cool weekends in the morning. 97.1 FM. Cool weekends in the morning with Weenie and the butt. WQHG 97.1. 97.1. 97.1. 97.1. We, 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 we have a butt. In the morning. Cool weekends. FM. Weenie. Weenie. And the mic. And welcome back. Uh, excuse me, I, I gotta find a lost kid. Can I use your mic? That's what she said. Whoa, you got butt slam! <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I could really use a hand here. That's what he said. Butt slam! <laughs> That's Manic Monkey on 97.1. Manic Monkey, 97.1. Oh, weekends in the morning. Oh, weekend long. We and the bus. In the morning. In the morning. On the radio. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> All right. I think I work with those guys. <laughs> Chris, I tell love us family about guy. it. You work for those guys? Tell us about it, Chris. Tar. <laughs> I, 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 no, I just, uh, you know, I think that's uh, an embodiment of, of a lot of morning shows of the 80s on the radio. And, uh, you know, I mean, before I got into engin- engineering, <laughs> I was on the air and. Although I wasn't one of those guys, I did work with a lot of those types of guys, and uh, it just every time I see that bit, I just laugh because it's re- it, it embodies everything that's annoying about that that time period and those types of shows in, in that time period. His name is Dennis. Uh oh, we can shut that off. Yeah, there's a spot to come on after that, Colin. So, uh, uh, Mr. T- Mr. Uh, Tobin, Chris Tobin, did, do any of the did the CBS stations go through a period like this? When I was working in small town radio, I think in in Richmond, Kentucky, it seems like the program director of the station that I worked at said, you know, uh, whenever we play uh, a jingle, uh, I want you to not play one jingle, but um, play two. So <laughs> we played one jingle and then another jingle and then back in the in the music. How about you, Chris? Oh, CBS had some of the, the, the real big top 40, if you want to call them that, the hot hit stations, the hot hits format from the Mike Joseph Consultancy back in the 80s with the uh, CAU in Philadelphia. 98 now was the, uh, the, the logo, the slogan. HTT in Boston. Uh, where else? They Chicago, WBBM, B96. Yeah, oh, yeah. The hot hits, uh, that style of uh, delivery was all over the place. You know, CBS had them. ABC, O&O's had them. Uh, there were a lot of copycats, if you will. You know, everybody went with the uh, the jingle packages from uh, Pam's, Series 27, Series 17, Jams uh, Productions, John and Ann, uh, was John and Mary Wolfert. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that was, that was as course, Chris points out, that was an embodiment of, course, of everything. Of course, uh, you know, in, in New York, you had one of the biggest morning zoos ever with Scott Shannon back in the day. Oh, uh, uh, yes, 1984. Did a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, the morning zoo formats that were coming out, yeah. Mr. Leonard. <laughs> For those of you who remember, yeah. Tom, Ray, did, Tom Ray, you were on there a little bit, weren't you? Oh, I've done a little bit of on-air work, and uh, yeah, that that clip. Uh, I've worked for. I'll work with people like that, but uh, just the constant uh, call letters there reminds me of a station I worked at. It was a talk format. 
Uh, and, and, and I'll pick on them. I don't know if they still do this, but it's in Connecticut. It's WTIC. Honest to God, we'd come out of a commercial break and it'd be WTIC temperature is 73 degrees. WTIC news time is 8.36. WTIC lead story. Governor signs budget. Now with the WTIC news, <laughs> it was oh, like, boom. AM boom. 1080, WTIC. <laughs> yeah, WTIC AM 1080. Radio you can depend on. Why, why, and why they did that? I'm why did they steel. say the call letters over and over again? So Arbitron. To. Yep. That's right. So, to help people make sure they wrote down the right call letters in their diary. That's right. Yeah. But, but, but I was like, you'd stand there in front of the newsroom and look at this guy while he was doing it and just shake your head. It's like, good Lord, bro, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I just remember you should have write it down and tell a friend. You know, we yeah. always used to make, we always used to make fun of those guys, you know, do like triple time, 7, 10, 10 after 7, 50 in front of 8. And, uh, you know, there's <laughs> all these crutches. And, and in fact, I remember uh, towards the end of my days when I was a program director, you know, I, I would have guys like this who'd say that on the air, and I would take them aside, and I'd say, listen, you know, get rid of those crutches because nobody talks like that. Do you go home and say to your wife, hey, how you doing? It's 7, 10, 10 after 7. Let's go outside and see what's going on. Hey, what's for dinner, honey? You know, that kind Some of thing. Some people did. And <laughs> Why probably, no time? Yeah. Bing bong, five minutes. Some of those did, yeah. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I'd sit there and go, listen, I, you know, talk like a human being. Talk like a person because people relate to people. They don't relate to you know, these, these kind of fake characters, you know. And so it was always actually a big challenge because those of us who grew up in that era, we all wanted to sound like that. That's it. And that's how we, we used to pretend being on the radio was to talk like that. So when we actually got a job in radio, that was the first thing we all did is we, oh, we all put on our radio voices and talk like this all the time. And I don't know what you're talking about, Chris. I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you try, try to break these people that habit. That was tough. You ever go through the McDonald's drive-in and order in a radio voice? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, welcome to McDonald's. Hey, how you doing? Order. I like a Big Mac, a large yeah. order of fries, and a diet soda, please. Oh, Thanks. I used, no, even better, I use, adjectives are your friend here. So what you want to do is say, uh, yes, I'd like a hot Big Mac and, and steaming hot French fries plus an icy cold Coca-Cola. Personally, I, oh. I, order a stomach, I order a stomach pounder with cheese. But anyway. Oh. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I want to ask, though, if you mentioned this peeve, you know, about having to mention the call letters every break, uh, like four times in the break, and I've I've worked at a rock station where they had to mention the call the the, uh, the slogan uh, four times in every break, and this is to remind people about what they're listening to. I don't know how people filling out an Arbitron diary could possibly get confused about what they're listening to, but I suppose they could. Now that we have the personal people meter technology, the PPM, does this matter anymore? Can we can we break those habits? Have we already? think so yeah i mean in our in our markets we've we've actually you know it used to be where we'd go song jingle song jingle song jingle song super song talk uh we've actually started doing uh segues with just musical logos in between without any call letters or, or slogans or anything and uh it seems to be working because you know there's no recall anymore needed you know you're not filling out a paper diary so you don't have to remember what you're listening to with this technology the meter does all that for you so it doesn't really uh you know it doesn't really hurt you if you you know, for example, don't say the call letters every 30 seconds. Video, um, so, I, you know, I think, I think Chris is probably in, in the same boat with, with his stations in, in New York. But that, that's kind of the big thing now. In fact, people actually, you know, would consider people doing that as talk. Even the jingles and the sweepers and things, if you're to focus group, people who think that you talk all the time on the radio, they count that as talk. So, in a way, it was kind of good because it allowed us to actually segue a few things and make it sound like we're playing more music. Mm -hmm. Maybe because you really are. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, it's interesting, Kirk. If you, if you listen to uh, like Sirius XM radio, the, to the um, the decades channels, like the like the '60s, '70s, '80s, and '90s, and uh, you you can actually hear the different styles from the eras. Because in the 1960s, you had all the guys who talk like this, and they talk up all the records, and they also say <laughs> '60s on six, boom, hit the vocal. And the '70s guys do that, but they slow down a little bit. The '80s guys kind of do that, but they more talk to you. And then you come to the '90s guys, who they just kind of stop in the middle of a thought and hit the vocal that way. And there's there's no ID, no anything. And it's like, why? Well, I, I mean, it 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 it's, it's really cool to just punch around and listen to the jocks and, and and hear hear how their deliveries have changed, you know, over the decades. Hey, I, when I put the question out about your favorite radio, and I'm sorry to backtrack a bit here, but uh, a couple hours ago. Somebody replied that their uh, their favorite radio was actually um, some software. It's the uh, the Wonder Radio. In fact, that came in. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, the the Wonder Radio 
That's, that's uh, the link is uh, wonder w u n d e r radio dot com wonder radio. So it's a, it's a, just an app for Android and iPhone and BlackBerry and, and Windows. Uh, they claim to have uh, one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish your thought. Somebody posted something in the chat room. I thought we would address real quick. Yeah, well, just that uh, Wonder Radio claims to have one of the best directories in the Internet, and that's really a, a key to getting to hear what you want and find what you want is having an easy-to-use directory. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Somebody had mentioned uh, a couple of people were, were asking about PPM and personal people meters in the chat room, and just kind of a brief overview. What that is is uh, for our ratings now, at least in the, in the larger markets, uh, instead of going to, it used to be where in order to rate radio stations, the way it worked is you'd listen to the radio and you'd write down in a diary what you've listened to, and you send that in, and that's how they tabulated how many people are listening to, the, to your radio station. Now they have what are called PPM uh, or personal people meters, and essentially we have encoding equipment on the transmit side, and people who are collecting the data, the listeners, were these little pagers. And the, the uh, encoder watermarks the audio of your radio station. It sends out an inaudible watermark buried in the audio, and the people meter takes that out. So whenever you have the radio on, whatever station you're listening to, the, the meter logs that for you, takes the watermark of, of the encoder, and, and logs that for you. So that, that way it's not relying on a person remembering what they listened to and writing it down. It records actual listening. If you can hear it, the meter can hear it, and it records that as, as having listened to the radio station. So that, in a nutshell, is, is PPM and how that works. So what you're so saying it's, is it's produced by Watermark Incorporated. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the PPM doesn't require that people remember what they were listening to and write it down. It actually uh, records automatically their exposure to different audio media. Yeah, Yeah, ex that's exactly it. And, and it actually, it's kind of funny because uh, even if you look back at the terminology over the years with Arbitron, it went to, you know, what radio station do you, did you listen to today to what radio station did you hear today to just the people meter hearing everything you do. So uh, not only that, but we encode different streams too. For example, uh, you know, our analog FM signal an HD signal get, get encoded the same, but our stream gets encoded differently. So you can see uh, radio stations show up in the people meter that are just streams. Uh, in Kansas City, there's an HD2 uh, that is being simulcast on a, uh, on a translator. That's getting ratings, and that shows up as an HT2. That's a separately encoded uh, uh, station. So instead of relying on people to write it down, which, you know, let's face it, it wasn't real accurate. Uh, you know, this way it records actual data, and, and no matter where you are. So you may not even really actively listen to the station, but you can hear it. And if you can hear it, then the, the meter picks it up as well. So uh, we touched on this a few uh, uh, weeks ago. I think Chris Tobin uh, alluded to stations are finding that their ratings are, some stations in particular, uh, are finding their ratings are not what they expected with the people meter technology <clears throat> that um, maybe you're finding out you're getting more listeners than you thought you were because maybe the people meter is actually measuring and maybe your target audience wasn't so good at writing it down or maybe you're getting lower numbers than you thought you should be getting uh, uh, compared to the diaries. Chris, well, what were your thoughts about that? Oh, that's true. I mean, I talked to a lot of programmers who were telling me because I was, where was I? I was at a seminar. I think it was NAB or doing some audio stuff, and I started talking to some of the PDs about the results with PPM in their particular markets. And I don't know if everybody's rated in PPM just yet, but they're probably close to it. And they were telling me that they discovered on a couple of their FMs that the numbers were much higher than they used to get in the paper diaries, and then there was some of their FMs were much lower than expected compared to the paper diaries. So, yeah, I think that the real-time measurement is, is definitely skewed both AM and FM uh, formats in directions probably for some down and others up. I think like stations like ours on the news formats, it's tough to expect high numbers because you, people are pumping in and out of the, the program, which is basically the, the, the feature of it. Whereas music stations uh, tend to be a little longer. And I'm sure Chris's stations and some of times in the other markets, you know, like we have several FMs that do very well. It's just I think the format just brings people in. They stay with it and go. And then there's also the algorithm that the PPM operates under and the, the methods and the, the time the yeah. intervals that it, it samples. <laughs> After I read about some of the methods they use, I'm like, wow, it's not yeah, just some how there. long they listen. There's some what? There's some tricks there for sure that you can, you can you learn from that. Yes, and I've read a couple of uh, Arbitrain reports and talked to some folks, and I must say they have definitely figured out the, the gaming of the system. 
Uh, you know, another thing, to, another thing to consider too is back in the uh, in the days of the the, the written diaries, uh, a lot of you know Hispanic stations, uh, AM day timers, those stations actually had their their ratings weighted because of the way the dies are distributed or distributed rather. Uh, that's gone away with PPM because they they actually try to weight the meters now. So that also uh, can change because you know in the in the past, uh, you know that that weighting may have changed. You know, may not have reflected actual listening. Whereas now, instead of weighting the ratings, they they kind of weight the amount of meters that come out, and that's changed some things too. I know when when it first came out, uh, a lot of uh, you know Hispanic stations in large markets went from number one to number two to you know bottom ten or you know bottom of the top ten, and they've made some changes there to to make that you know work a little better. But there is some of that going on as well. So, uh, can you guys allude to any of the of the, of the tricks that you can use uh, are the things that you should be aware of you know, with PPM technology what what programmers should know or what engineers should know about PPM technology to make sure their stations getting counted uh, at, at least for every listener the tune that that is exposed make or sure you don't process you process your audio in the best I won't say the cleanest but the most uh, proper way possible uh, some tests that I've done if you distort the audio audio enough you could, over time, not you know, not every time, but over time, create dropouts and issues with the uh, the PPM encoding. Uh, but you have to be really nasty with some of the processing. But I've noticed that some EQ settings, and if you really get crazy with some stations, I'd like to process in the mid range to create that punch in small radios. Uh, you can you can create havoc in the PPM world. Also, and make sure you have as many redundant audio paths as possible, because when you're not play, passing audio through that encoder. You're not putting out a data stream, which means you're not getting counted. And uh, as far as the audio goes, you need to be uh, conscious that there is a threshold that the yes. uh, uh, encoder will operate on. And if you drop below that threshold, the encoder will immediately stop sending codes. Um, it won't report an error unless, it's, I, th I think it's about three minutes. So it won't report an error, but it will stop sending codes for that time um, because, in theory, you'll be able to hear them, and that's why they stop. So the input to the encoder needs to be, you know, it needs to be ridden slightly, but it needs to be above that threshold, uh, at, well, preferably at all times. Yeah, the threshold, too, is uh, somewhat elusive. I don't know if some folks have told me plus four is okay, but others say the boxes were designed for plus eight as a reference. And yeah, I Ar Arbitron, uh, Arbitron two weeks ago, Chris told me that the... Um, Receiver was designed for a plus eight input, and that the box was designed for a plus four. Right, so. that's the latest that I got. Also, so that you know drives you batty trying to make sure you have a a closed loop to make sure you have everything working right. Because I don't know how many plants operate these days with plus eight as a reference in the in the building. Oh God, <laughs> it can't be many. They, they used to be common way back when, but not now. I can tell you guys, I, I use uh, for the PPM monitors. I use the Burke system that uh, monitors the uh, the receivers and emails whenever there's any kind of issue at all. And it's fantastic. I mean, we get, you know, it'll do a self-test of the backup encoders uh, on schedule and emailing the results of that. But if for some reason the, there's an encoding error or there, the encoding stops or it switches encoders, anything like that, uh, it'll instantly generate emails and alerts and let you know. So, I mean, I immediately know if there's anything going wrong with PPM. Yeah, we've done. We have the email alerts as well, and uh, we've gone one step farther with putting a uh, enunciate, not enunciate, displays in the studio. So not only do we get the email, but we get the operators on duty immediately get a heads up, and then they can you know immediately switch to our backup encoders to see if that corrects it while we're on the phone trying to figure out what's going on. But yeah, you, you got to be encoding. I mean, the the new rule is no encoding, no money. Basically, as we come down. Here's a, here's an interesting story about uh, encoding. It it was actually kind of gave me a little faith in the system, I guess. Uh, we had a, a huge blizzard here uh, over the winter. Huge blizzard. Uh, one of, you know probably the biggest one in 20 years. And two days later, I get a I get a call from uh, from Arbitron. He said, you know, listen, we you know we've been going through your data, and there's an anomaly here. Uh, you know, I, I suggest you know I, your encoder doesn't obviously your encoder encoder's not throwing out any errors, but uh, why don't you throw it over the phone so we can spec it out? We did. And they said, yep, it's encoding properly. Well, it turns out that there was a huge power outage in town. And enough where, for a day, the data didn't get loaded. And, he, and that's, you know, in fact, they said that. They're like, well, you know, it could be that in, in another day, all those data will actually get caught up and we'll be okay. So, but that's, you know, we've had that happen where there's been huge blackouts. And for that day, the, the data doesn't get uploaded. And all of a sudden, a station's ratings for the day 
you know, go from something very large to almost zero, and it sets off alarms here that there's a problem, and we, we call the station and, and that sort of thing. But I, I found that very interesting. Chris, tell us how that data gets uploaded. With, if you are selected by Arbitron to carry around this personal people meter, what, what do you have to do to it? There's a, there's a dock that you dock it, it charges, and at the same time sends the data to Arbitron. I actually have not seen how the dock gets wired up. It's either phone or, or Internet, uh, but it's all, it's all in one. So it, it, the, the, the data itself is collected on the device. Then when you go to set the device in at night to, uh, to charge it up, it then in the background uploads the data to Arbitron. Huh. And I take it that that dock must maybe can be connected to a phone line? The, the early models had a phone line. Okay. I think later models now do either or, because they're finding out that a lot of uh, participants in the surveys don't have hard lines anymore. Yeah, I, so I, think, I, I think it's I think it's internet uh, broadband. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, if if you if you Google a PPM Arbitron, you'll find a lot of pictures of of the uh, several different models of PPMs, and oh, you also find a, a radio station rack full of uh, uh, of the encoder e equipment too. If you want to get a look at that. Well, we, we ought to do a whole show on, on that subject. It's pretty interesting. And not only is it interesting, but it's vital for radio stations to get right. Because if you don't get it right, you don't get counted. If you don't get counted, you don't get the agency buys. And, I'll tell you, I, that's, I mean, it's just a lot of pressure on engineers for that. Uh, you know, probably oh, yeah. more than anything else. You know, I, I, when we first, uh, I was really nervous when we first put this together because it is, you know, for the first time, a tech, you know, it's reliant on technology. So if we screw this up, our stations tank, and we're you know it's a big problem. So, uh, you know, fortunately, there's a lot of safeguards in place. And uh, as we, you know, as I found with Arbitron, you know, if something really does hor go horribly wrong, uh, it doesn't take more than 24 hours to get a phone call and say, hey, you might want to check your stuff. So, uh, that's all good, but uh, it's it's scary. <laughs> so, you, so you can actually get feedback or a warning from the Arbitron folks that hey, you may have a problem. You're not we're not getting yeah, enough well, that, data from you. Yeah, that was the issue with the with the uh, when we went through the. Um, through that storm, and I, you know, apparently a lot of people didn't upload their PPM data because they had no power. I got a call from Arbitron the next morning saying, "Hey, listen, you know, you're something's going wrong because, you know, we, what we've gotten today, what they say is outside of their norm. So they'll say, you know, what what's normal for you, you know, we've gotten, it, it, we can't tell you anything more than that. Just ah, that it's outside okay. of the norm, you may want to check your stuff. And if your stuff looks like it's okay, what they will do is the the, the water marking is robust enough." Where you can hold a phone up to a radio and they can decode it in real time and tell you that it's working right. <laughs> Isn't so, that amazing? That's what we did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, my if they called me, uh, none of my stations are on PPM. I own some stations in some very small markets. But if they did, I just have to tell them, well, you know, we just don't have that many listeners. That's not surprising. All right, that bombed. <laughs> <laughs> and and the audience is uh, quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. The applause hey, light went out. We lost power. Yeah, where are the crickets? <laughs> hey, uh, this is a great time to segue. We've got coming up in the show, we're still going to talk about, are you an audio snob? And if so, under what circumstances? When do you care that the audio sounds good? So, hey, in the chat room, you may want to give us some ideas on what you think about it. Also coming up, 60 hertz power and the uh, perhaps deregulation of that. Will your clocks and lights all run screwy? And uh, maybe a little update on the national EAS test all coming up. But first, I want to tell you about our sponsor for this show. It's my employer, so I'm so proud to have them as a sponsor of the show. It's Telos Systems. Now, Telos has been around for almost 30 years, a company that Steve Church who's an engineer, very bright, clever engineer, and uh, also a talk show host. Uh, started the company way back in the, uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, and Steve came out with a product. Uh, it was a Telos Hybrid. It worked so well that when he sent it to some engineers in New York City, they said, it's, it's not working right, Steve. It's, it's not working right. We're not getting any audio back from it. And Steve says, yeah, it's working perfectly well. That's, uh, that's, any audio you send to the caller doesn't come back. Well, we've come a long way since then uh, to what the, the, the newest phone system that Telos uh, is, is promoting. Uh, it's just out. It's just now beginning to ship out of the factory. We've got uh, about a half dozen beta sites around the world. And it's the Telos VX system. The Telos VX is a voice over IP based system. Now, you don't have uh, if you don't have uh, SIP trunks or voice over IP coming into your building, no problem. You you get a third-party gateway product, say from Cisco or Avaya or Patton, and these 
products will take uh, POTS lines or T1 lines uh, or PRI circuits, and they'll turn that into SIP trunks. SIP being the, the, the you know, session initiation protocol, the standard protocol for voice over IP uh, uh, phone calls. Well, these SIP trunks come into the VX engine. This is a two-rack unit box. And it's really simple. On the back of the VX engine, you've got three plugs. There's a power plug. Okay, that's, that's one. And then there are two Ethernet ports. One is for the SIP trunks, or the, the WAN, wide area side of things. And the other port is a live wire port using uh, Axia's live wire technology. And uh, uh, this is what takes the audio on out uh, to the rest of your plant. Let's say, yeah, here's a picture. Look at this. This, this picture represents your new multi-studio multi-line phone system at your cluster of radio stations. You say, huh? What? Wait a minute. It's hooked onto the same network bus or the same switch as my audio console. Well, yes, if you have an Axia audio console system, then you've already got most of what it takes to have a phone system. You just add the Telos VX engine and a few uh, phones that are actually powered over power over Ethernet or with a little injector that comes with every one. So, uh, the Telos VX system, voice over IP, multiple studios, multiple lines. By the way, you can redefine groups of, of uh, lines, if you will. You know, in the SIP system, um, you know, in, in, with, with older talk show systems, uh, uh, you have more lines than you do hybrids, right? Because hybrids were hardware and uh, expensive. Uh, and you might have a 12-line phone system with, that has two or perhaps four uh, telephone hybrids. Well, in a voice over IP system, all the hybrids are done in software. And every line is connected to a hybrid all the time. It's kind of different. And so what you're switching is, is you're switching which live wire stream is coming into the console, or if you don't have Axia consoles, coming into the audio node, bringing audio out and into the, uh, the console that you do have. Uh, it's a really interesting system, the Telos VX. Go to the website, and there's white paper there. There's a brochure about it. You can read about Telos VX. Um, we have it on the air in... Um, I can't say. I'm, not, I'm just not allowed to say. It's on the air at a major TV network. And the engineer, the audio engineer in charge of the network, uh, his first comment when they put a caller on the air was, you know, it sounds like a phone, only a lot better. <laughs> so it's very clean. It's so cool. The Telos VX system, go to the website. It's telos-systems.com slash VX. Telos-systems.com slash VX. And you'll read all about the Telos VX system. Thank them for being a sponsor on This Week in Radio Tech. All right, gentlemen, uh, audio snobbery. Audio snob you know, my, my wife and my daughter, they accuse me of being an audio snob. Like, I won't, my <laughs> daughter's listening to, uh, upstairs, she was listening to her, uh, her iPod Touch through the little speaker that's built into it. And uh, it, it was sitting on the counter just blaring away something that you couldn't even tell what it was. And I said, Madeline, really? That's that just sounds awful. Oh, you just you just an audio snob. What do you guys think about audio snobbery? Well, it's just the work we do. It's, it's you know you, you expect there's certain expectations. That's how it works. Uh, you know, if you're a video person or a cinematographer, and you see something that doesn't meet what you're accustomed to, because that's what your your trained skills are, you you tend to make note of it. And unfortunately, technology has advanced such these days that. You know, in the common home, in the kitchen, the tabletop radio, the uh, Walkman, if you will, to use a brand name, most folks, anything goes. You know, that's really what it comes down to. So, you know, if you want to be an audio snob, so be it. But, you know, but Don, Tom, I'm sure you have family members that you probably cringe at times when they do stuff, as, just so as, as I do. Oh, constantly. But, but I was going to say that, uh, you know, our job is to take... It, it, it is to be an audio snob on our end and make what's going into the system as, as clean and, and as good as possible because you're right, Chris, what comes out of the other end could be anything. Could be a table radio, could be an iPod, could be a teeny tiny itty bitty little set of speakers uh, that somebody attaches to a computer and garbage in, garbage out. I mean, real blunt. What, what do you, Chris Starr, what's your opinion on audio snobbery? Do you get accused of this? No, because I'm actually far from it. I, you know, I love nothing more than an audio processor cranked to 11. I'm guilty as charged. In fact, uh, you know, one of the things uh, my PDs love is that I can, I can make uh, make any of our stations sound real loud without a lot of distortion. So, uh, honestly, I, you know, as I get older, especially, I, I, you know, I, I don't appreciate it as much as I used to. You know, I, I, I almost 
prefer kind of that process sound. I, I know when uh, we first went to HD, uh, before, you know, processing uh, HD and, and analog, the same was in vogue when we first turned on HD many years ago. Uh, very, you know, very little processing. It sounded charring to me. It sounded weird. I almost, I kind of didn't like it. You know, I, I really liked that that process sound. Um, now, having said that, uh, you know, I do appreciate, uh, you know, good sounding, uh, good sounding loud processing. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the work that that uh, Bob Orban and and uh, uh, why can't I think of uh, the Omnia guy? Uh, oh, Frank, Frank Foley. Foley. Yeah. Frank yeah. Foley. I'm big fans of, of both of them. I mean, each of their processors do things way differently, but I appreciate, you know, both of them. Frank's, Frank's big into loudness and, and cleanliness, and, uh, you know, Bob Orban is very much a purist, and I take things from both of them and, and uh, you know, take that with me too. But uh, I am, I, you know, I appreciate a good radio, but I'm not, you know, I don't. I listen to low bitrate things, and, you know, I, I really don't mind. Now, having said that, on the air, I insist that everything's very pure. We do nothing but uncompressed waves uh, on our hard drives. I don't allow the MP3s on the air because we do do so much manipulation that it sounds really bad really quickly. Uh, but, you know, I don't mind a little bit of processing. <laughs> yeah, Chris, you've really taken my question to a very fine degree, and, and I appreciate that. I was uh, actually kind of driving more at... You know, look, think about in your average home in the 1950s or 60s, you had probably one, maybe two radios. You probably didn't have a car radio. And that one radio was in glorious monophonic sound, and it probably sounded pretty good because it has a speaker this big, this big, right? And, to, you know, what passes for a speaker for entertainment nowadays? Sometimes it's that, that little, that, well, that, that's a speaker nowadays. And so I'm talking about the huge difference between, you know, the sound emanating from an iPod touch laying on the counter uh, versus something, anything reasonable. No, I, I, and I, I refer to this study. I wish someday I'm going to find it and post it because I refer to it a lot when we have these conversations. Uh, people were played audio from various bit rates and people actually preferred the, the weaker sounding things. And I think that's because as these devices have become cheaper and, you know, tiny and tinier and tinier speakers, you know, you could have really nice full quality wave files you couldn't tell playing it on that little speaker i think people have just gotten used to that and they don't mind it and uh you know i think people have become less about you know surround sound and and uh that sort of thing in the car now at home i know a lot of people you know with home audio that's a different situation but with radios i think it's gotten to the point where i think with music uh, you know i have a hard time finding a lot of people that care that much about it Really, that that's that's interesting, that, and that's I think that's kind of telling. You have a hard time finding people that care that much about it. Uh, Chris, I mean, obviously, you guys in in New York, you're transmitting fabulous audio on your on your FMs as clean as you can, while maybe being as loud as you can. Do you find that a lot of people have this attitude? It, they don't care that much. Oh sure, oh sure, we we get a lot of that. I mean, we have one of our stations, uh, CBS FM, which is a classic hit station. That audience tends to be very particular. We, uh, I mean, I'm definitely a fan of processed audio and enjoy a loud, you know, nice uh, pumping, not pumping, but nice robust sound. And uh, I also enjoy the other side of the spectrum. So I'm, I'm all for both sides. But our, our CBS FM station, which is a classic hits, uh, the audience there can be very particular. We've uh, <laughs> sometimes played uh, music that was, let's just say, uh, the original, it was not as good as the original for whatever reason and who knows where we got it from and we got phone calls we actually have people calling and saying it doesn't sound right i'm like wow interesting you know there's no high no treble i won't say high frequencies there's no treble or uh <laughs> or the bass the, the bass is missing there's no treble or bass or it sounds sounds boxy other than that um not many folks i mean we have a pop station i don't think i've ever received a call or read an email of somebody complaining about the audio quality uh and that station is very loud very processed and does jump out at you so, yeah, I think it's just the sign of the times. There's Tom, still have people I, who enjoy it. I, I, I know uh, Chris Tobin's got some uh, AM stations there in the city, but, Tom, you've got one big AM station there in New York City, WOR AM. Yep. What do you find people will put up with or not put up with regard to, to listening quality? Uh, with AM radio, they put up with a lot, you know, just from the, <laughs> yeah. um, well, well, no, no just, just, just from the medium and the, and the way it uh, is perceived out in the uh, perceived and received out in the uh, field um, you know because AM itself is, is subject to many uh, noises many uh, 
distortions that are caused just by the environment. I mean, I mean take uh, go into an area sometime with your car, listen to a station with a low signal level, and uh, turn on your GPS and see what happens to that station. Uh, it'll it'll get wiped off the face of the earth. Um, so uh, we uh, we keep it pretty loud. We keep it pretty proud. Um, I think if we actually turned it down a little bit, people would complain um, because we tend to pop out of the pop out of a radio, um, and we're always there. We're not constantly in your face, but we're kind of an in your face radio station because we want to be. Uh, we want people to notice us. We want people to listen to us. Um, you know, a, a lot of our FMs depends on the format, but we have uh, a 70s, 80s station in uh, in the Hartford market, and it's it's loud and proud. It's got that nice process sound. We're not killing it. We're not you know throwing it against the wall by any means, but it's uh, it's loud, it's proud, and it sounds good. And and let me tell you, those listeners, Chris is right. Boy, if if you play a wrong version of a song, or if you uh, if if we make a little tweak on the processing, people start calling. No, I don't. <laughs> It's unbelievable. The, uh, the, yeah, I, the, I would agree with Tom on that. It, yeah, it we, seems what you're willing to put up with uh, is is dependent a lot on what the content is and, of course, how bad you want to hear it. If you're listening to uh, your favorite sports team and it's the, the last few minutes of the game and, you know, the, the radio's getting all crackly or if you're listening to FM and you're going up and, you know, you're driving through the hills, every time you go up a hill, you hear it okay, you go back down the other side, oh, my gosh, it, it went away. Hey, there's people pull off the road in a place where, where it sounds okay to listen to the end of the game. Uh, or, or if you listen to AM radio, you know, they'll put up with a lot of, of uh, poor signal to, to hear. It's you know, co very much content-driven. Would you listen to that all the time? Probably, probably not. At least uh, I wouldn't. Maybe some people would. Um, uh, how, uh, you know, you know, all of us are transmitting audio from our stations. That's probably very pristine, very nice. That we don't have that kind of problem. I guess I'm really looking at the, the psychology of what people will put up with uh, well, you, when they're, they're listening. You know, I, I think you nailed it on the head, Kirk. I mean, 100%. It's all about content. I mean, if the content is good, people aren't really going to be that concerned about how it sounds. And, and you know, people will download crummy MP3s if it's song they want to hear. They'll listen to stations through static if it's if that's what they want to hear. And actually, you know, I've made some some pretty good money here in this area. Uh, with with class A's, you know the the 3,000 watt stations, the smaller ones that are kind of, you know, outside of the metro area, you know, setting up their processing and 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 doing some tweaking and things to to just get them heard, and you'd be surprised, you know, people who who call these stations and where they're from, and I'm going, boy, you know, signal barely, you know, barely gets halfway there, uh, you know, on a, on a on a good day, and these people are actively tuning these stations in, and I, I think really it's it says a lot that nowadays it's less about it's kind of like it's less about the fact that you're you know you're having fast food it's you really like that hamburger and and i think with with the audio it's it doesn't matter if it sounds good or bad if it's something you really want to hear you'll put up with it oh that's uh, well, why we need crystal it, it, go ahead in in, in in kind of a I, I i agree with the content uh chris but uh you know with certain things like if you if you have a poorly processed jazz or a poorly processed classical station those people won't put up with it, I, and, and oh, it yeah. doesn't matter what the content is. I mean, they're gonna scream, holler, and yell, and they just they'll just tune it out, you know. Well, but if if on the other hand, if it's a if it's the only jazz station, I mean, there's there's a jazz station at least uh, there there was up until I don't know if it's still on the air or not. There was a jazz station on AM that did very well. Again, if it's the only place you can get it, you're gonna take you're kind of gonna take what you can get. Now, I agree with you if it were a full market signal and. You know, there's other things going on, but uh, you know there are there's uh, the new jazz station in Detroit is an HD2 on a translator. I, I can't imagine that that the fidelity on that is fantastic. So, I, I think you're you're right to an extent. I think it all depends on the situation that you're in. Right. All right. Let's move from uh, high frequency to low frequency, specifically 60 hertz. Tom, you had some inter interesting uh, information about the power system in the U.S. We're all we're all 60 hertz AC power, you know, 120, 240, or as the movie, the Mr. Mom movie says, 240, 241, whatever it takes. What, what's, what's your news about 60 hertz, Tom? Oh, well, there have been several articles lately about a, uh, an experiment the power companies uh, or the power, power industry wants to try. And now I, uh, Chris Tobin asked me uh, offline here if, if I could come out. Yeah, they, there we go. Uh, it says the power grid change may disrupt clocks, and yeah, that's true because uh, the time base for you know for the for the clock radio on your bed or the clock 
on your uh, microwave oven or the clock on the stove or maybe even the clock on the wall is based on that 60 hertz power. And the power company is required to keep it at 60 hertz plus or minus a certain tolerance. And I don't know if they still do it today, but in days of yore, back when I was a kid, uh, and back when I got in broadcasting, I mean, you'd watch the clock on the wall around midnight, and it would speed up or slow down, and so would the record that was on the air, because the power company was required to have X amount of cycles per day, and if they weren't going to meet that, they sped up or they slowed down to meet it for the 24-hour period. Um, but to go beyond that article that said, may disrupt clocks, um, our broadcast transmitters usually keep an eye on the frequency because the, the, the power supplies are designed for 60 hertz. If you were to lower the frequency to 50 hertz like they have in Europe, that will increase the, uh, the heating in the uh, transformer and you know, you'd have to derate the, uh, the power supply and therefore derate the transmitter. Um, so you know, this could have bigger implications. I, I don't think we'll see it wandering all over the place, but uh, you know, I, I mean, as an example, we had a transmitter recently. We, we had a power failure at one of our sites in Buckley, and the uh, uh, generator came on, and the governor had a problem on the generator. So the speed of the engine let, uh, drifted, and it went low. It went down to about 55 hertz. Main transmitter wouldn't even try, and the backup transmitter would attempt to come up and would take a look and go, 55 hertz? Uh-uh, and would shut off. So, you know, there, there are implications to this, that if that frequency wanders, we could have problems, medical equipment could have problems, uh, there's a lot of places that could have problems. We have to remember 60 hertz was a cheap way of uh, getting time base for a lot of products. So over the last, what, 20, 30 years, you know, from your toasters to ovens, uh, VCRs that have any kind of clocks on them, a lot of them use 60 hertz in some form or shape, and, you know, if you start moving that around and, and the tolerance is shift, the electric companies want to save money because for some reason now all of a sudden it's another excuse. You're gonna, I, I think it's going to disrupt more than just clocks. It's going to, as you point out, it's going to disrupt a lot of things. And I think we don't even realize how much stuff is probably referenced to the power line. I know well, some, one of our somebody... transmitter sites has issues with the local utility company with fluctuations. And we recently installed a brand new solid state transmitter that monitors every parameter on a power line. And, uh, it's interesting the, the amount of variations, interruptions uh, that we get. I, I shouldn't say interruptions that take us off the air, but uh, little spikes and, and anomalies in the waveform that most equipment would ignore, but more sensitive stuff notices, and it's just amazing what's, what's going on. Well, somebody pointed out to me the other day, Chris, that uh, uh, computer networking switches and routers and such, uh, the lower end ones, tend to reference to the power, power line to get their internal yes. clock frequency. So your, our computer networks are going to be affected. Yeah, this, pretty much anything with a wall war probably does. <laughs> this, uh, this article, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the article in uh, Business Insider magazine by uh, Robert Johnson, and it, it's pretty light on tech details here. It only says that uh, clocks could run up to 20 minutes fast. Well, that's, that's a pretty light, uh, even hard for an engineer who understands uh, what happens with regard to time basis for a clock to, to, to draw on, on how much that means that the, the power grid, you know, what, what's the tolerance that they're talking about, about uh, allowing? Uh, 55 to 65, 58 to 62, 59 and a half to 60 and a half? Any ideas? I, I haven't seen anything on, on what the tolerance would be. I, I've just seen articles that said this is going to be happening. Uh, it would be interesting to see if we could find somebody from the uh, power industry to see what they have to say about it because it's, uh, it, it's an interesting topic. And, and, you know, we're right. It goes far beyond, um, you know, far beyond clocks. Well, I know talking with our generator folks, they, they usually tell you that the power utilities, shouldn't ex you shouldn't, they don't expect to do anything more than plus or minus 5% on a 60 cycles. And I think generators or generator industries, uh, the gen sets, are, I think, are less than that as far as the tolerance on the generator. So if you're talking that kind of stuff now, and they're talking about letting it waver around, I don't know. That's, it's going to be interesting what happens. Well, 5% is, is almost 3 hertz in either direction. That would be about 57 to uh, 63 hertz is 5%, at least that's what the calculator says. Um, and that seems pretty broad to me, 57 to 63 hertz. I thought the you know, power company uh, tended to be uh, much more accurate than that, and on the order of you know, half a hertz or so. But I, 
I don't know. Uh, it's something that I would want to point out is you know, I've worked at radio stations on the air that had uh, uh, a clock that was kept accurate by the 60 hertz line frequency. Usually this is the kind of clock, well, obviously the kind of clock that plugs in the wall versus a quartz clock, which is run by battery, right? And it's interesting that the quartz clock over a short period of time will be far more accurate than the 60 hertz clock. The 60 hertz clock, uh, you, you try to hit the top of the hour news, or in my case, uh, the bottom of the hour news. Uh, they see some stations I worked at, both top and the uh, bottom hour of news. And, and the 60 hertz clock would wander about by upwards of uh, five or eight seconds per hour. So one hour, it would be dead on. And the next hour, it might be five seconds uh, ahead when it was time to hit the news. So you, you, know, you would have to listen to the countdown from, from the network delivered over phone lines back then. Uh, but the quartz clock, if you could set it right, so the, the news came on or the, you know, the, the beep came on and you'd set it right for the top of the hour or the top of the minute anyway, um, the next hour you could depend on that quartz clock being right. But in three days, that quartz clock could very easily be uh, five or eight seconds off or ten seconds off, whereas the power line powered clock over time, would be very, very accurate. Uh, it might wander around that five seconds or so, but you know, a month from now, it'd still be wandering around five to ten seconds or so, but still be uh, in that range. Isn't that what you? Isn't that what we're talking about with possible problems with uh, power line frequency if they let it wander around more? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah def definitely, definitely, definitely with clocks. Uh, but, but like I said, with, with the transmitters that monitor this stuff, and uh, with a lot of other equipment. Um, you know, it, there's there's an awful lot of stuff that references to that 60 hertz that uh, you know we may be unaware of. Um, and we're going to find out in a real hurry. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, well, there are there huh. are chips that are made that are designed for that purpose. Um, uh, what do you call it? They they take the power line frequency and it creates a uh, accurate real time clock base. There are chips that are designed uh, made you, you put in equipment. Uh, you know, I don't know where it's applied, but I do. I have read about it, and I was just looking on couple of websites and it's you know wall transformer as we know the wall wart it gets converted to a clock waveform gets divided puts through a filter and then a vco and P pll and comes out with an accurate uh, real time clocks uh, output that's on an ic chip 6 pin uh, i'm sorry 8 pin uh, dip so right there it, think of the places it, that chip has probably been applied <laughs> is any of this being driven by the fact that um, a lot of folks have home power generation systems solar or wind and uh, at, if they're generating more than the home is using, they're allowed to put it back on the grid. Well, it's got to be perfectly phase matched to the power that's on the grid. Now, this is really, this is no trouble at all for an electronic circuit. So you've got a generator or the, the solar panel, solar panel's generating DC, and there's, there's got to be an inverter there, not only to feed your home, but then to feed back to the power grid uh, at times when the home isn't using as much as it's being generated. Well, that's just all got to be matched up, but that's, that's, a, that's a cakewalk electronically, isn't it? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, it definitely takes a little doing. But I think if you're going to be selling power back to the, putting power to the grid, I'm sure the local utilities have, there's probably some ISO or uh, public utility uh, specification that require, that needs to be met. Otherwise, you're right. You can't have the frequencies, you know, wandering. Unless the like, utility companies are doing all the heavy lifting and just take whatever they get and they'll convert it and guarantee it gets onto their network properly. But no one's talking about that. It's a good point. No one's no one's bringing that up. And and I I mean you're you're on the same wires. I can't imagine that the power company can do something else with that. It's kind of like uh, well you know, you, you got to put power back on the grid. Uh, you know the current would be you know would be more outbound from your house than inbound, and it would have to be synchronized with what was there. But all I'm saying is that synchron you know having an electronic uh, inverter that's taking DC and making AC, uh, that's that can't be a very difficult thing to phase lock it to the incoming power. Um, of course, I guess you have to have a sample of that incoming power. Maybe the problem is if you're sending power out all the time, hmm, i got to think about that. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure I could read up on that. Wikipedia or somebody would have some info on that. But how do you stay synchronized to a system that you're feeding to? Are you still getting any? I mean, do you have to maybe quit feeding for a second or two to check your phase every now and then? I don't know. It's beyond me, but I'm sure we could look it up. Interesting subject. Um, Hey, we got, uh, actually, we're out of time. We need to go. We're going to have to save a couple uh, couple subjects for next week, including uh, the national EAS test. So let's all brush up on that, see if we can pass the test next week. Hey, our show has been brought to you by the folks at Telos Systems and the new VX phone system, voice over IP based. Very cool. Multiple studios, multiple lines, and 
pretty inexpensive for that. Uh, check it out at telos-systems.com slash VX. I want to thank my uh, co-host on the show, Chris Tarr. I know you had to rush home to make it on the show tonight. Thank you for being here from Mequonago, Wisconsin. No problem. I enjoyed it. I uh, enjoyed it, too. And you can be reached at uh, geekjedi.com. That's where you hang out, right? Well, that is correct. All right, good. And your forums, your engineering forums are where? Broadcastengineering.info. All right. Good information there. Maybe someone can answer my question about 60 hertz power and how that stays synchronized. I don't know. I could actually talk to one of our guys at the, one of our facilities. We actually, uh, one of our buildings is about the size of a small city with the power it draws. And during the summer months, we actually uh, put bat power back on the grid. Oh, cool. I'll find well, out. I'd like, yeah, I'd like yeah, to know about I'll, that. I'll find out if we're, if we're still doing that or we just simply go off the grid and then there's no, nothing going back. But I'll, I'll check with them. Okay. See what I can actually, find yeah, in Singapore, I was talking to. Um, to Gene Novacek. We've had him. There we go. Sorry. Uh, Gene Novacek with ENCO. Uh, he has built a, an energy efficient green uh, uh, farm uh, in, in Massachusetts where he generates during the daytime a lot more power than he needs. And so he's feeding to the Massachusetts power grid from his home in, uh, there just west of Boston. Um, he's the person we should ask. He's yeah, involved yeah. a lot in that. Yeah. That's and exactly hey, right. he's, an, he's, an, he's an MIT grad. <laughs> So he'll tell us all about it. Uh, so, hey, Chris Tobin, thank you for being us from uh, New York City. Appreciate you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And, My and Tom Ray, Tom Ray from the Hudson Valley of New York, where he's sucking all kinds of electrons into his ham shack. Well, of course, I have to. It, it's what we do. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and you also put up a lot of bad quality on those long distance ham contacts, don't you? Oh, you put up a lot of bad quality, but you have a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Uh, Colin, uh, Weir, I appreciate you switching the show today. Thank you very much. And thanks to the Twit Network for having us uh, on there as part of the, one of their family shows. If you want to listen to our show, it's real easy. You want to subscribe to it or anything like that, go to twit.tv slash twert. Twert stands for This Week in Radio Tech. You can uh, listen or watch uh, right there on that website. Uh, you can also subscribe or download. So no matter what your uh, listening model is, it's right there, or viewing model. It's right there at twit.tv slash twerk. All right, next week it's a War Stories episode with our guest Andy Linton from uh, the Emerald Isle, Ireland. Looking forward to that. We'll see you all next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.